So in this video, I'm going to talk about statistical modeling using R. I'm going to take kind of a fairly general approach to this particular topic. So this isn't really going to be a tutorial so much as a bit of an overview of how to go about conducting statistical modeling using R. So this is going to take in, I guess, two main sections where we'll talk generally about what the purpose of the model is, and then start talking about how R can really work quite nicely to give you a flexible way of building all sorts of different statistical models without having to learn that much about R and different functions in R. So I'm going to start out even a step back, I guess, by talking about what is a model? What do we mean when we talk about statistical models? Um, and you probably think I'm going to start talking about something like this, plot some points in a line. But actually, even more generally than that, whether we're talking about a scale model or whether we're talking about a human model, uh, they're all sort of getting at the same general idea, which is that they are approximating reality. But they're also approximating reality with a purpose. So our scale model is giving us an idea of the physical geography of an apartment complex or whatever we're building from it so that we can make informed decisions about our layout or whatever. Our human model is providing an idealized version of reality to try and sell us a product by making us think that this is something that we could achieve if only we bought X or did Y. And it's similar again with our statistical model where we've got some data which we're using to try to approximate a real situation, and we're using the model to try and best summarize the trends, the patterns, whatever in that particular relationship. We often think of this process as kind of separating the signal from the noise. We want to try and remove parts of the data or ignore parts of the data, which is just underlying variability. It's not telling us anything informative and extract the signal, extract the interesting information and the real world trends that we can start making conclusions and predictions and whatever from. And there's lots of, I guess, sub purposes to building statistical models. We can be trying to identify specifically which variables from within our data may be linked to an outcome response variable and quantifying the exact nature of this relationship. And we can then take this a step further by trying to make predictions about what future observations might be. And we can also think a little bit, not just about the trends and the noise, but also the underlying variability. So trying to quantify what we don't explain, what we can't explain, as well as what we can explain. And we're also thinking perhaps that we might want to be comparing our results to other models we've seen in papers or other models we might be fitting from within our own data to try to best understand reality, to try to best understand our specific data analysis problem using this statistical modeling approach. It's not really any kind of presentation about statistical models if this quote does not appear. All models are wrong, but some are useful. So to me, the first half of this very famous quote from George Box, that makes perfect sense because as I've just explained, we're approximating reality. We're having to make decisions about what we ignore to try to bring out and tease out some useful and interesting findings. The model is not reality, it's an approximation of reality. But we want to ensure that our model is useful, that the trends we're picking out from our model are indeed trends which exist in the real world. And that we, if we're trying to make predictions, that the predictions we make may be some degree useful. And we can quantify perhaps how likely our predictions are to come true, as well as just making outlandish statements uh, from extrapolating our data. Let me give you an example of a modeling problem here. So on my y-axis, this is cases of a particular disease, I think it's death, sorry, of a particular disease uh, from London in the 17th century. And you can kind of see year along the x-axis, and if we're looking at our scatter plot here, it seems pretty clear to me that we're seeing an increasing trend. If we're thinking what kind of trend that might be, it wouldn't be unreasonable to draw a straight line for it and have a simple linear regression model. We'll talk a little bit more about the R code to produce these plots and to summarize the model. But 
If we look at the output, we can see quite clearly, yes, this is super, super highly statistically significant. If we're thinking about this relationship between time and the number of deaths from this particular disease. If we look at, say, some model fit statistics like our R squared value, we'd also be seeing pretty high numbers here. 77% of the variability in our outcome variable is being explained just by the passage of time. So if I am an epidemiologist in 1700 in London, and I'm trying to work out, okay, what do I need to be thinking about for the next 50 years? I see some data like this. I might be tempted to think, okay, let me extrapolate this trend onwards into this new world of the 18th century. And this is where I expect our trend in cases is likely to go. It turns out if I was an epidemiologist in 1700, I wouldn't be a very good one because what happened in reality was the cases, the deaths flipped around again. What we weren't seeing was a linear increase. We were seeing the top of a curve. So the model should have been trying to show us if it was useful that, okay, it looks like maybe cases might turn around and decrease in the next few years. With this new curve in our data, if all we know how to do is simple linear regression, we don't get a particularly good model at all. You can see if we try to fit just a straight line through this particular data, it's useless. Um, it tells us, oh, there's not really any trend over time at all. And if we look at our p-value, this is non-significant, our r-square value, negligible, two and a half percent. This is showing us that we really needed to explore our data before we fitted any models. If we just brought in our data, fitted a simple linear regression, looked at the output, our conclusion would be, oh, hang on, okay, year is not an important predictor factor for this outcome variable. In fact, it seems to be pretty key. We're seeing a huge trend over time here. So we might be thinking, okay, let's do a different sort of model. Let's fit something which will allow it to go up and then go down again. This would be, I guess, a classic kind of example of a quadratic curve. And this time, if we look at the output, we see lots of stars, lots of highly significant p-values, a much more healthy looking r-squared. It looks like this is a better model to explain the trend in our data. But is it a better model for predictive purposes? Because I'm realizing I got caught out last time. I'm now the same epidemiologist now in about 1740 or 1750. And I'm realizing if I put my line just a couple more years into the future, this line is going to go negative because it's getting very close to zero. And I don't think it would be a very good model that would start predicting that in two years time, we're going to have negative numbers of deaths of a particular disease. So I then might start thinking, OK, I need to come up with an even more complex mathematical function, not just a quadratic, but something else. And going through this kind of approach can be very dangerous because we can end up with something like this at the end where, OK, yes, we predicted our data perfectly, but there is no way of extrapolating beyond what we do if we end up with a model which joins up all the points. There's no useful trends. Uh, and there's no useful summaries we can make from joining up all the points together. We're basically back to where we started from. And this is a statistical problem we call overfitting, which can be very common if we try to fit something which is too complicated onto a data set which is not large enough or just can't support that level of complication. And there's another quote that I like to bring out at this point, this time not from a statistician, but I think it captures this idea pretty well. Uh, so this is the more accurate the map, the more it resembles the territory. The most accurate map possible would be the territory, and thus would be perfectly accurate and perfectly useless. And so that's a quote from American Gods by Neil Gaiman. Very much not a statistician, but I think it gets at this idea very well, where if we try to overcomplicate things, we end up with something totally useless. So in this particular example, as the epidemiologist in the 18th century, what I should have been thinking about is trying to look for other variables that might be explaining this change over time. Rather than trying to fit this super complicated mathematical function, I need to be thinking about, okay, at what point did cases start increasing? What variables might be linked to that? And similarly, when cases started decreasing, what variables might be linked to that? Can I find 
covariates or cofactors which might do a better job of explaining these trends because I could otherwise end up in a very complicated, completely useless modeling approach if I just try to fit a curve onto that mathematically. So how can I go about a modeling process in R? We've seen in the output so far that I'm heavily using ggplot for exploring my data and also adding lines onto my scatter plots. So combining geomsmooth and geompoint with ggplot is a really good way to explore your data when you're going about a statistical modeling process. And doing this before you start the modeling process will really help you to uncover key factors to then maybe adjust what you were planning to do based on what you're seeing in that exploration. The main workhorse function you've been seeing so far, this is the LM function, the linear model function. And the syntax for this works quite similarly to what we've seen before probably with t-test, or if you've seen the LM function before, where we have this formula notation of y tilde x, where y and x are the variables in our data set, and then we have a comma and the name of our data. Unlike a lot of other functions which are more simple statistical tests, like the t-test, here what we look to do is we always generally save this as an object, uh, a model object, because then we can use different functions to access different summaries or different kinds of post hoc testing from the model that we have created. So we'll assign the linear model to be an object in a very similar way to how we would assign a data set to be an object or a value to be an object. And there's lots of functions that we can then use to get the summary tables we've been looking at so far, just extract out the coefficients or an another table or look at some residuals or make some predictions. I'm not going to talk in too much detail about all these additional functions. There are links below or to the side or somewhere which will go through a more tutorial how-to approach for statistical modeling. Instead, what I'm going to talk about is what do we do if we don't just have a simple linear regression model? So we've seen already with one variable, it's just y tilde x. If we want to do a multiple regression, it's the same function, and we just put a plus between our two variables. We have x1 plus x2. And if we have an x3 and x4 and x5, it would continue onwards. Again, thinking that if it's going to be super complicated, always having this idea of overfitting, are we doing something too complicated in the back of our mind? And if we want to have an interaction between the two variables, instead of a plus, we could have a star. So instead of saying that these uh, variables are all acting completely independently of each other, we could allow an interaction between the two. If we're doing another kind of model, let's say we're doing a logarithmic or exponential type curve. We've seen already a straight line and we've seen already a quadratic curve, but if we're doing a simple transformation of just the y or the x variable, we've got a log linear relationship, we want to try some other simple transformation, we can do that within the LM function. This is still a linear model, even though we're perhaps looking at a log linear model. And we've also seen with the polynomial transformation, we use the LM function again, except instead of just saying X, we can use the, the poly function within R to say we want a second order polynomial, so a quadratic curve, or a third order polynomial, or an nth order polynomial. Again, with that idea in the back of your mind, we don't want this to be overcomplicated and overfitted. But there's so many other types of model and analysis that you've possibly learned about in your introduction to statistics class beyond just a linear model. So one thing I'm sure you remember learning about in introduction to statistics is analysis of variance. Something that I don't think you probably learnt, or if you did, kudos to your statistics teacher, is that analysis of variance and linear regression are basically the same thing. They're both linear models. Mathematically, the only difference between the two is that linear regression requires a numeric explanatory variable, a numeric predictor variable, and analysis of variance has a categorical explanatory variable. So when we call this in R, when we do analysis of variance in R, we still use the same LM function, and the syntax is exactly the same, y tilde x, 
The only difference is our data. There's no difference in terms of the mathematics and there's no difference in terms of how R deals with this. And this is actually true of a surprising amount of those common statistical tests that you might learn in an introduction to statistics class. So there's this really nice resource online which breaks down so many different types of these common statistical tests and basically tells you, yeah, all of these are just linear models. And it even gives you R code to reproduce the statistical analysis just using the LM linear model function. I'm not necessarily suggesting if what you really wanted to do other kinds of tests, so like Spearman correlation, you should use the LM function, but it's possible to. Um, and it's not completely true though, it's actually not true at all to say that all statistical tests are linear models. There's maybe two main uh, underlying commonalities between these linear models where we are assuming there is an underlying uh, distribution of normality in our residuals when usually are making that assumption. And we're also assuming that all of our data points are independent. But what happens when we don't satisfy those two criteria? Well, in R, the way that we deal with this is not very different at all, even if the underlying statistics is perhaps a little bit different. So when we are dealing with something which perhaps doesn't have a safe assumption of underlying normality of the residuals, we don't use an LM function, but we might use a GLM function. And the way that we call this in R and the functions that we can use to summarize this model and interpret this model, they're the same functions. The syntax is almost exactly the same, except we need to tell it what assumption are we making if we are not making an assumption of normality. So the most common assumptions you might see here are when we have a binary variable and we're dealing with logistic regression, binomial regression, or if we have a variable which counts things, it's a count type variable, but we might use a Poisson. Sometimes you might also use a gamma or a quasi-Poisson or a quasi-binomial, all sorts of other distributions that we might use with a GLM instead of a normal distribution. Again, thinking if it's okay to make that assumption of normality, there's no reason not to. We want to usually use the simplest model which provides a good summary of our data. So we don't want to overcomplicate things if we don't need to, but if we want to take a step further in R, there's no difficulty at all with this. And similarly, when we have an issue with the independence of all of our data points, let's say we, we want to fit a multi-level model, or we have a clustered sample, or we have a blocked experiment, or we're tracking the same person or the same unit of observation over time, where there is some dependence between some of our observations within our data. In this case, we move from a generalized linear model into a generalized linear mixed effects model. This is where we talk about adding a random term to our model. This random term will be explaining this level of dependency. So the function that we use in R, again, it looks quite similar. If we're making that assumption of underlying normality, we move from LM to LMER. And we add in, I guess, an extra component, Z, which will be defining exactly how this dependency structure works. And equally, we can be extending this approach into a uh, non-normal assumption about our residuals as well. And hopefully you might have put two and two together and realize that this is going to be GLMER. And the difference from LMER is we add in that family argument at the end to explain if it's Poisson or binomial or whatever. And it's not just true of these models in this particular family. So when we're dealing with up till this point in the video, there's been a lot of common DNA moving from an LM to a GLM to a LMER and GLMER. They're all kind of building sequentially up, but there's other types of model which don't fit necessarily into this same framework. I just kind of spammed out a few off the top of my head and threw them on the screen right now. Things from machine learning approaches or Bayesian approaches or other different kinds of statistical technique which make quite different assumptions or have quite different underlying mathematics within R, this formula notation, the y tilde x comma data, 
And a lot of these summary functions, these useful functions, are common across all of these different statistical approaches. So once you've kind of got to grips with the basics in R of using LM and GLM, which are usually your first entry points into modeling, and you've got a little bit comfortable working with these, you suddenly realize you've unlocked this gigantic sandbox with so many different possible statistical approaches that you could take with your data. And knowing how to do that in R is quite straightforward once you've got to grips with those basics. The difficulty is learning the statistics behind them because we always wanna make sure that whatever model we're fitting, it makes sense. And also that we can interpret whatever the results are and we can understand perhaps if our data is not compatible with that particular modeling approach. It's very easy to start doing bad analysis in R because we've learned a few steps and then we've immediately jumped to the next 10 and got quite excited because we saw a really exciting model in some paper that we just read and really wanted to try it out without really thinking about the underlying methodology and the underlying statistics. So my key points from this uh, video are to always know your data and explore it well before jumping into a formal model and use what you learn in that exploration to inform that modeling process. If you see a curve, don't try and fit a straight line. If you see that a variable you thought probably wouldn't be interesting or wouldn't be related to your outcome, but it's looking interesting from the uh, exploratory analysis, try to incorporate that into your model as well. And always have in your mind this trade-off between something which is perhaps too simple to provide a good summary, but also trying to avoid something which is too complicated and will be overfitting or is just going to be completely unnecessary to try and tease out important and useful results from your data. And also remember that to begin with, doing this in R might take a bit of practice. But once you've got to grips with these basics, you'll start to see how it's really easy to start learning hundreds or thousands of different modeling techniques in R. But learning the underlying statistics behind these hundreds or thousands of uh, modeling techniques can be a lot trickier. So don't neglect the statistical theory and the basis behind these models just because you can see some R code which will run it. And if you're looking for help going through this process, I think I'm just going to highlight a couple of resources which are pretty nice. So there's the R Companion to Applied Regression, which also has its own package within R associated with it. And in terms of what the content of this is, the process that I led you through from LM to GLM to LMER, that follows quite closely with what happens in this particular book and the scripts that they provide alongside this book and the package which goes alongside that. So this is quite a good gateway into this whole topic to start taking what we see from LM and then seeing how this extends into other forms of statistical model. Another resource which I think is really nice, perhaps in a bit less detail, but covering a slightly wider breadth of topics, is from the UCLA Institute for Digital Research and Education. This is not just R, they have code for other statistical factors as well, but on their website, they have a whole bunch of different statistical models and provide code and examples and explanations of the theory behind those statistical models. So if you already kind of know what you want to do, or you've come across a particular kind of model and you want to know more about it, this is quite a good resource for trying to find some R examples behind that. So hopefully watching this video has given you the confidence to go ahead and start trying to practice yourself, start trying to learn more about how to conduct all of this exciting statistical modeling using R.